So how are we going to build really big things? I mean, we're talking about building things in space. We're talking about building huge infrastructure in space. There's people like Elon Musk and Richard Branson putting huge amounts of money into commercial space flight. But are we really going to build all of these monolithic components down here on Earth and rocket them up there? It's going to take a huge amount of resources. It's going to have a huge cost, both monetarily and environmentally. It's going to be staggering. I think the reality is we're probably going to be going out mining asteroids and building these things autonomously with the legions of robots. But the thing is, it's not just about what we build on space. It's what we have to deal with while we're here on our planet. The fact of the matter is, it's not just about whether or not climate change is a thing. It's how are we going to adapt to the changing climate at this point. The majority of the world's population lives in low-lying areas. And we're either going to have to pick up millions and billions of people and move them inland, or we may have to go around and build walls all around us. And in the US alone, we have 33,000 miles of uh, structurally inadequate levees right now. And the current state of the art technology is something along these lines. It's piles of rock and bags of sand. And we can build them at about five feet an hour. So think about 33,000 miles of levees just in the US. And we have to do that all around the world. Maybe there's a better way to do this. This is the state of the art manufacturing facility. This is an Airbus A380 manufacturing facility in Toulouse, France. I actually had the opportunity to go here last year and see this in person. And that was the first time I realized that this is a ship. This is a giant ship that goes in the sky. It has nearly 1,000 people on it. And it is the most advanced manufacturing. There's monolithic components, the wings, the engines, the fuselage. They're all made in different places all around Europe. And they're shipped in to this factory. They all come in through one door. And they're picked up by these big, giant cranes you see, and these huge tracks running along the bottom. They're all picked up by these automation systems that pick them up and move them around, move around all the different components relative to this overall structure, this big box that we've built around everything. They move them around, and they're very careful not to walk around all that other stuff, because if you see what all that other stuff is, that's stuff for us humans who are also helping this, this build. We've got platforms, we've got walkways, we've got carts that we don't always put back in the exact same spot. And the fact is that we don't put it back in this exact same spot. And that makes it really hard for the automation systems. The automation system needs a very structured environment. And this is structured for us by our standards, but it's not necessarily structured for a robot. So it has to move very carefully as it's moving all these pieces into place. And so what you start to realize is if we're going to build really big things, we're generally building them inside big boxes. And we don't want to have to go around and build boxes bigger and bigger to make bigger and bigger things. And then we also don't want to have to have we want to be able to speed up the rate at which these things are happening. So we don't want necessarily want people in the process for building all these things. We want to be able to go really big and really fast without our human intervention. So there's a whole new way we can look at this. I present to you a whole new way of making this. It's called digital materials. This is where rather than taking monolithic components and building them in off-site somewhere and putting them together, we take a discrete set of individual components that have a discrete set of functionality, and we assemble them together into a bulk material that has much higher complexity and capacity and functionality than the individual bit. It's very similar to something like biology, where you have DNA-based strands that go together and form into uh, much more complex structures. So there's a bunch of different processes that you can use. So, so you could take your structure, and you could define it depending on your use case. So a previous student in our lab, who's now a researcher at NASA, Kenneth Chung, had developed a vertex-connected octahedron structure made out of unidirectional carbon fiber. Turns out it was one of the lightest, strongest materials ever made. Cool. Really awesome, right? But he also made a Kelvin structure, where you could take a, a Kelvin lattice, and he showed that he was actually able to make morphing wings. Also super awesome. Also, both of these turns out to be really difficult to assemble. Unless you're, unless you're a group of graduate students sitting around with high dexterity hands and vision systems and all kinds of these control systems. I don't like to do fussy, repetitive tasks. I like automation. And so I've re turned, the, turned the picture around and said, OK, how do we make a structure that actually goes together and provides us with all the performance characteristics that we want, but is also easy to assemble? And so we've been experimenting with all these things. In the picture, on the left, you see something big. In the middle, you see something strong. And actually, this is, a, this is that piece right here. And it can carry my weight, which is 
cool. And then it just a giant exploration of a bunch of different ways that we may be putting these pieces together. And you see, when we start building with vast arrays of the, the, the same piece, it just calls out for automation. So I bring you automation. We've got humanoid robots and we've got traditional manufacturing. This is actually, I had the opportunity to work on this robot. This is at Mecha Robotics, where we're building humanoid robots. The whole idea of this robot is that a robot that is capable, that is full of sensors and has all kinds of complexity that allows it to operate in the unstructured environment that we live in, that we have around us. That's why we make them of humanoid form. That's why we put force control into them. It's a very beautiful robot. It's rather imprecise and it's really fun to play with. On the other picture, you have a standard industrial robot arm actually performing one of the most advanced computational uh, design tasks ever seen. This is for a, a computationally designed architectural pavilion. And this robot, as you can see, is huge. It's robust. And it's living inside of a cage. It's in just another box here because it doesn't know you're there. It could just as easily cut this part as well as cut right through you. And with this generalization, both these robots are generalized. They're, the whole point of them is that they can operate in this either fully unstructured environment or environment that's completely closed off. But they're both generalized. They're not optimized for a task. So what I'm talking about doing is building task-specific robots. So this robot is designed to live inside this structured environment. So this robot picks up, comes over, grabs an element, turns it around, places it in piece. It, comes back, grabs another element, and takes a one-bit motion. So it's lots of simple motions that are optimized specifically for the, the cell spacing of the structure. But if you think about it, all these pieces that are moving around have some amount of mass to them. And with that mass, come, I either have to slow down the motion or I need to stiffen everything up, and that adds bulk, and so the whole thing ends up becoming this. You start chasing your tail. But I started to think about this process, and it seemed like there's a lot, of, there's still a lot of fussy stuff going on in this process. So I looked at, started thinking about other, other systems that work similarly. A turret press for manufacturing sheet metal is this big machine that just goes kadoof, 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 and pounds out shapes and features outside of sheet metal pieces. That moves at about 150 milliseconds per shot. Uh, a nail gun shoots at 100 milliseconds per shot doof, 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 every time a nail is shot out. And a sewing machine, like a high-speed commercial grade sewing machine is about 40 milliseconds per stitch. So you start to think, if I want to be able to be building things with, the, with each of these motions moving that fast. With that previous robot you saw, my estimate ended up being that to fill a, a cubic volume with pieces about these sizes, these little 100 millimeter pieces, that it was gonna end up taking an hour and a half. That seems silly. So, I, so the design evolved. This one has a little bit more control over where I'm placing the pieces uh, each, for each step, for each cell, and then they get dropped down. It still seemed like it wasn't fast enough. So I rethought it a little bit further and said, okay, how about, we can, how about we optimize the cell to be even more specific and the robot to be even more specific? And what you start to see here is what I call the octa turret, or the one-bit bot. This robot is based off of these individual bit elements. And as you'll see here, the stepping motion is actually also the, the part placing motion. So we're reducing all the different steps that need to happen. And so this, this robot is based off of this element type that we're actually getting made injection molded at this point. And we're actually going to, this is, this is the robot that's about to happen. The, so the robot itself kinematically aligns with itself and with the structure at every step. It reduces the tolerance loop that's required in order to precisely place each of the pieces. And because it's a fully structured environment, there's no human involved here, and it's only ever interacting with itself and the one previous step behind it, it can move extraordinarily fast. So this is what I'm going to build right now. And there's other students in our lab. They're building computational tools. These computational tools allow us to not only design the structure, but design the functionality of the structure. And so, as I said, with these simple set of base elements, maybe we can build these airplanes. Maybe we can build even something like this. Maybe we can actually have our legions of robots that are gonna go out there and mine the asteroids for us and come back and bring, build up our parts and allow us to build space structures. And ultimately, it'll allow us to go boldly where no man has gone before. <laughs>